Hi, thanks very much for joining us. I'm Alan Gemmel, the director of the British Council in Israel, and you're joining our third global web chat with scientists and research partners in the BIRAX program. And today we're broadcasting from the British Council's office in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And we're focusing on neurodegenerative conditions and the work of world leading medical research foundations and scientists all involved in the BIRAX initiative. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Charles French Constant and Professor Siddharth Chandran from the University of Edinburgh, Catherine Crawford, the Scotland Country Director for Parkinson's UK, and Dr. Sorrel Bickley, Head of Biomedical Research at the MS Society. We're also joined by Alex Brooks, Head of the BIRAX program, and colleagues from our office in Edinburgh. I'm especially pleased that we're here because BIRAX has been able to invest £1.6 million into collaborative research between labs in Scotland and Israel. Um, we're also today joined by colleagues, British Council colleagues from around the world, particularly people from the UK and our offices in Europe, from the Middle East, from the Americas, East Asia, and from India and Russia. The format for the 40 minutes or so that we're together is that Catherine will start and tell us about the work of Parkinson's UK and about Parkinson's disease. Then Sorrel will tell us about the work of the MS Society and MS. Uh, Byrax recipient Professor Chandran will focus on MND and ALS and talk about his work in the Anne Rowling Clinic at the University of Edinburgh. And then Professor French Constant, also a Byrax recipient, will talk about his work on MS. And um, we have some questions to ask, and there may be some in the room towards the end. And afterwards, Alex will tell you a bit about the Byrax program and why we've set up a £10 million stem cell research fund between the UK and Israel. So we'll start with Catherine Crawford and Parkinson's UK. Catherine is the Scotland Country Director for Parkinson's UK. Parkinson's UK leads, influences and funds research to ensure new and better treatments in years rather than decades against Parkinson's disease. They're the largest European funder of Parkinson's research and have invested £70 million in groundbreaking research. Their friendship opportunities, they offer friendship opportunities and support to everyone with Parkinson's, their families and carers. Their campaigns raise awareness and change perceptions of the disease. We're delighted that Parkinson's UK are a partner in the BIRAX programme, funding scientists in Cambridge and at the Technion Institute in Israel to develop a breath test for Parkinson's. April is, uh, has a Parkinson's Awareness Week from the 18th to 24th, so stay in touch to find out more about that. Catherine. Great, thanks very much indeed, Ellen, for that really comprehensive introduction. That's pretty much summed up my talk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll save us the next 10 minutes. But thanks so much as well for inviting us along to have this opportunity to share with you here in Edinburgh today and to have the chance to, to reach out right around the world. And I really hope this gives people watching everywhere a chance to think a little bit about Parkinson's and to ask any questions that they may have. So yes, so today I'd like to just really quickly in the 10 minutes that we have, look at how Parkinson's can affect people um, and what Parkinson's is, UK is doing using both our own resources and working with others right around the world to tackle the issues that affect people living with Parkinson's disease. So what is Parkinson's? Well, in 10 minutes, with a bunch of eminent scientists here in the room, I really don't think I can do that justice. But Parkinson's is an incurable and progressive neurological disorder. Once you've got a diagnosis with Parkinson's, you're going to have that for the rest of your life. But for many people living with Parkinson's, that can indeed be a very long time. I spent time only last week with somebody who'd had Parkinson's for nearly 40 years. So that gives you kind of a measure. It's a lifelong and progressive incurable disorder. It can affect anybody. Think Michael J. Fox, think Muhammad Ali, think my auntie. It can be anybody, anywhere in the world. There's around, we estimate there's around one in 500 people living in the UK with Parkinson's. That equates to around 127,000 people across the UK. And we estimate extrapolating that outwards around seven and a half million people right around the world. So although it's not a common disorder, it can affect many and it does affect mostly those people as they, as they age, more people are diagnosed older than younger. But last week I spent time with a young man living in Dundee, about an hour north of here, who was diagnosed age 24 with Parkinson's. He's now 34 and his younger brother's just been diagnosed too. And that's a bit of a bit of a sentence to receive. It can affect, if you have Parkinson's, it can affect every single aspect of your daily life. It affects communication, walking, sleeping. Go on our website forum at two in the morning, you'll get a lot of good chat going on then. Walking, sleeping, 
everything. People with Parkinson's struggle with depression, anxiety, you name it, the list goes on. Here at Parkinson's UK, we are the only support and research charity in the UK and we pride ourselves that people with Parkinson's inform every single thing that we do. In fact, our charity was funded in 1969 by two sisters who lived with Parkinson's. The, the, the members of our charity have created our three themes that we're working towards in our current strategy, taking control, getting the right services, and of course, better treatments and a cure for Parkinson's, the ultimate aim. But I'd just like now to touch on the other two themes so that you can look at other aspects of work that the charity does. The first theme is taking control. We want people living with Parkinson's to be empowered, to take control and live life to the full in a society that really does understand Parkinson's. We hear too many stories of people being out and about and being accused of being drunk or being getting a row in the supermarket queue because they can't get the money out of their purse quickly enough. So what are we doing at Parkinson's UK to help that? Well, obviously, we've got a website full of information for people living with Parkinson's. We have a substantive resource of a helpline, and we have a team of Parkinson's local advisors working everywhere in the UK, providing vital one-to-one -one support to families living with Parkinson's. In fact, that was the first job I had with the charity. We provide a range of options for peer support, self-management, and we have a huge range of volunteer-led activities right across the UK. If you join one of our volunteer groups, you get a chance for a cup of tea, but you also get a chance to have a go at singing, Zumba, Tai Chi, you name it, you can have a go at it, depending where you live. Really important for our members to have those opportunities to take control. The second raft of our strategy is getting the right services. We firmly believe that people with Parkinson's deserve to get the best quality health and social care services wherever they live. So here in, U in the UK, we have created our UK Parkinson's Excellence Network, a real platform and an opportunity for the people living with Parkinson's to have their voice heard, for Parkinson's UK and the health and social care community to, to get together to drive forward education for the workforce, to drive up standards and improve practice for health and social care prof professionals with Parkinson's. And of course, all of that leads to really the third theme of our strategy and really the, really the crux of what we want to do. We believe that we need to fund vital research for better treatments and a cure, which is so desperately needed for people living with Parkinson's. We want our strategy to support researchers to cut red tape and to share scientific breakthroughs happen, happen, as they happen and give the, give, give the community an opportunity to really capitalise on these research opportunities. We want to encourage the community to think more creatively and to open up new avenues of exploration to lead towards that vital cure. So what are we doing at the charity to help speed things up? Excuse me. Well, we're trying to unlock scientific discoveries. We're trying to find out what goes wrong in Parkinson's and come up with ideas that will lead us to new treatments and that vital cure. And that's where our joint funded project with, with Biorex comes in, with the Nanotech Institute in Israel and right here in Cambridge in the UK, hunting for developing this breath test that could detect Parkinson's really early and help in that vital hunt for biomarkers. These we're also initiating vital drug discovery programs. As scientists uncover insights into, with exciting potential, we're working with an advisory group with a wealth of scientific and commercial expertise to help us decide on the most promising projects to take forward. We're also working on a critical path for Parkinson's. This is a multi-million pound project bringing together researchers, drug companies and regulators working with the Critical Path Institute in, in the United States to change clinical trials, to make them smarter and more likely to succeed, to speed up the day when these new trials can turn into better treatments and ultimately that vital cure. We're, taking, we're trying to take the fastest reach route to better treatments by also tracking down drugs that are already approved and in use for other conditions, drug repurposing. And at the moment, we've got a call out for anyone with Parkinson's anywhere in the world, 
If you've ever taken a medication or a drug for some other condition and you found that your Parkinson's symptoms have got a little bit better because of it, drop us an email. We're trying to find out if there's any of those magical drugs out there that we could repurpose and use for better treatments for Parkinson's. So finally, as the world's largest patient-led Parkinson's charity, everything that we do is driven by people affected by Parkinson's. Our work focuses on what matters, delivering care and support and better treatments now, but looking forward to that vital, delivering new treatments in years, not decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're quickly going to move presentations over. Uh, and I'm very pleased to ask Sorrel Bickley, the Head of Biomedical Research at the MS Society, to speak to us now. The MS Society is the UK's leading MS charity, providing information, support, funding, research, and fighting for change since 1953. They're fighting to improve treatment and care to help people with MS take control of their lives. They have 35,000 members, 5,500 volunteers, 265 staff, and they say one aim, to beat MS. More than 100,000 people in the UK have MS and there are still no effective treatments for people with progressive MS that can alter the course of their condition. The MS Society have invested £17 million into 70 research projects and are a partner in the Virax programme funding research between labs in Cambridge and Hebrew University on repairing nerve cell damage. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by echoing Catherine's words to say I'm really, really delighted to be here today to have the opportunity to talk about MS and the MS Society. Um, so I want to give you a bit of an insight into the science of MS and talk about the role of the MS Society um, and also feature our Virax partnership as well. So just to start with some science, uh, MS or multiple sclerosis is a condition of the central nervous system. So this is the brain and spinal cord highlighted in orange on the right there. Um, so the nerve fibres that make up the brain and spinal cord have this really important protective coating called myelin, and you can see that highlighted in orange. Um, and this serves a really important function of helping to speed up the transmission of messages along the nerve fibres, and it also provides a physical protection for the nerve fibre. So it's almost like a, a plastic coating on an electric wire or something like that. Um, but what happens in MS is that actually this myelin coating becomes damaged, and this, this happens due to the immune system attacking it. So as this myelin coating becomes damaged and breaks down, it causes the messages travelling along nerve fibres to become disrupted. And over time, as that damage builds up, it can cause the underlying nerve fibre itself to become damaged. And when those nerve fibres become damaged, they die, and this means that the message can't travel at all. So this damage can occur anywhere in the, the brain and spinal cord, so the symptoms of MS can be incredibly variable. So it, it can range from um, really obvious symptoms, so things like problems with walking, problems with balance, issues with mobility, um, problems with things like bladder and bowel, but also a huge range of invisible symptoms. So things like a really chronic overwhelming fatigue, something that's not just kind of needing to go for a sleep, it's a really overwhelming, um, completely taking over sense of tiredness. Um, but also pain and problems with cognition, so memory and thinking. Um, and so MS is incurable and it's incredibly unpredictable, both day to day and also person to person. So many people live with a relapsing form of MS, where they have flare-ups or relapses, where symptoms come and stay around for a few weeks, and then they have partial or sometimes uh, complete recovery. But also many people live with a progressive form of the condition, where symptoms get gradually worse over time. Um, and that's where a lot of our attention is now focusing. So in terms of MS, in the UK we have over 100,000 people living with MS, um, and globally we estimate that that's about 2.5 million people. Um, and it's absolutely a condition that strikes when you're young. The symptoms usually start in your 20s or 30s, but once you have MS, it's, it's with you for life. Um, and actually it affects roughly around three times as many women as men, and that's something that we don't yet fully understand the reason why. Um, but where did the MS Society come in? Well, we're the UK's uh, leading um, MS support charity, um, and we our aim is really to provide practical help for people today and hope for tomorrow. So we fund a world leading research programme which is dedicated to understanding more about MS and driving forward the search for new treatments. But also we want to support people in the here and now. 
So we help to fight for better treatments and care. So a huge amount of work goes, goes from the MS Society into the recent um, progress that's happened with benefits and, and PIP you've heard last week. Um, but we also do a great deal of investment in information and we provide a helpline for emotional support. Um, so we try and balance the here and now with, with hope for the future. Um, and we launched our new strategy last year, which is Together to Beat MS, which you can find on our website. Um, so in terms of the research, where are we now? Um, there's really been actually a lot of good news in MS research. We've had really a revolution in the treatments available. So 25 years ago, there were no treatments licensed for MS. Whereas today we have 11 disease modifying treatments for the relapsing form. And those treatments can reduce the number of relapses people, can, people have. And they also bring benefits in the long term. So this is really great news um, for people, particularly with the relapsing form. We do have made some progress in symptom management treatments and therapies. There's some quite good practical options out there, things like fatigue management programs, or the MS Society invested in an, an early trial of Botox for bladder symptoms, which has proven to be quite effective. But the real unmet need, the real drive now, is that we need to find treatments to slow down the worsening of progression in MS. So today we have no licensed treatments that can slow down that gradual worsening of disability. So this is really the focus of our work at the MS Society now. It's our number one research priority, um, and that is really shared globally by MS organisations as well now. Um, so our research programme is um, multifaceted. We have broad research investment. So we are trying research understanding the causes of MS. So there's a number of risk factors that we know can influence someone's chance of developing MS. So things like genetics, some of the things highlighted here, certain viruses that you might be exposed to. Um, but we also then try and translate that knowledge of the, the causes of MS and the biology of MS. We want to move that rapidly into developing treatments. So targeting those processes that we know are operating and turning that into something that can be useful in the clinic to change the lives of people living with MS. Um, but we also invest in more practical research um, as well. So things like symptom management and um, treatments and also services. So testing and developing services that can make a real difference to the lives of people living with MS today. So this is where our Birax partnership comes in. Um, so this is a really exciting project that we're, we're co-funding with the British Council. So it's identifying new ways to try and repair that myelin. So the myelin is that protective coating around nerve fibres. So this project is led by Professor Mark Cotter at the University of Cambridge here in the UK and Professor Shlomo Rochenka at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, and this is a really interesting project, really getting at the underlying biology of MS. So actually when this myelin damage occurs in MS, our body does have the capacity to repair that myelin to some degree. So that can happen naturally. Um, but it seems like when the myelin damage accumulates, we get this um, sort of debris accumulating. So the damaged myelin builds up in the surrounding area. And that kind of inhibits the body's processes to do that repair. So this project is all about trying to target that, finding ways to brush away that debris, clear the debris away, dispose of it. And then maybe this could trigger the body's own mechanisms to help repair that, that myelin. So it's a really exciting project. I think it's about one year in and things are going really well. So we're really proud to be co-funding this initiative. Um, so finally, I couldn't leave you without um, talking about some of the ways you can support our work. Um, we absolutely want to raise awareness of MS. It affects around one in 600 people in the UK, so it's much more common than many people think. Um, but we always want help fundraising. You can do these crazy things like this uh, skydiving picture, but um, we also have a cake break fundraiser, which is much more popular with me. Um, although this year I've made them this well. No, I'm very enthusiastic about it. I'm running the marathon for the MS Society in about a month, and it's, it's getting tough now <laughs> with the hard time with the training. Um, but we're always looking for new volunteers. We have an incredible, um, really valuable network of volunteers in the UK, which we're incredibly proud of, but we're always looking for new people to join us. Um, so you can find out more about all those things at our website, mssociety.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really is uh, a great privilege to work with partners like uh, you and, and uh, Parkinson's UK. Um, uh, and I know that you're not the only person in your organization running the marathon because your CEO is also running and has a just giving page. So if you Google her, you can find that and get some money. 
Um, I think because we're going to make some changes in the room, we're going to go straight to Siddharth and slides online, if that's possible, Milos. Yep. And I'll introduce Professor Siddharth and Chandran. Uh, that might be easier. Yep. So Professor Chandran is the McDonald Professor of Neurology at the University of Edinburgh and Director of the Centre for Clinical Brain Sciences. He's also the Director of the Ewan McDonald Centre for Motor Neuron Disease Research and the Director of the Anne Rowling Regenerative Neurology Clinic. Uh, he achieved a Bachelor of Medicine at Southampton University and did his neurology training at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at UCL at the University of Cambridge and has a PhD in Developmental Neurobiology and has been a consultant neurologist, university lecturer and fellow of King's College, Cambridge. Um, his TED talk, Can the Damaged Brain Repair Itself, has had almost one million views. Um, and Siddhartha is a BIRAX recipient and working with a lab at Hadassah Hebrew Medical Center in Israel, exploring the therapeutic potential of cell therapy in the prog progressive phase of MS. And hopefully I've wrapped it on just about long enough for you to be plugged in and be ready to go. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm just looking here <coughs> to see if it's coming up. That's all right. I think it's it's on around the world. So why don't it's you start and we will uh, make sure it gets in the room. Well, thanks very much, <coughs> Alan um, and Sorrel and Catherine. So what I was going to do in the next 10 minutes or so, tell you a little bit about my work and our work, some of which is supported by yourselves through Biomed and indeed the MS Society. So rather than um, focusing on Parkinson's or MS, I'm going to use dementias as the broad area and neurodegenerative diseases in particular, and use motor neuron disease, which I'll tell you a bit about, as an illustrative example of the power of... Wait, where is the... So the mic is in there. Yeah. Is that louder or is that okay? All right, okay. So, um, I hope you can now hear me. Um, so I'm just going to use dementias and motor neuron disease to illustrate some basic concepts and try to convey to you the opportunities that human stem cells offer for medicine, and particularly for an emerging medical discipline, which is regenerative neurology. You've already heard from Catherine and Sorrel, the need is for the development of treatments, and treatments and trials. I mean, that's the bottom line for patients. Keep going. So what you can see on this first slide are some of the major diseases that we would group together under dementias. So in addition to Parkinson's and MS, you've also got Alzheimer's and motor neuron disease. The thing that all these diseases share is that they're devastating, progressive, and incurable, and invariably fatal. The only question that, that they differ in is how quickly are they fatal. So something like motor neuron disease, sadly people will die within years, one, two, three years. Patients with Parkinson's disease will live much longer. So they influence quality of life, but ultimately these diseases are fatal. The numbers of people affected by these diseases is staggering. So in the UK, UK is not very big. There's only 60 million people in this country today, in 2016. There's about 1 million people affected by one of these diseases. In other words, one in 60 has a progressive degenerative brain disorder for which there are no treatments. The numbers are set to rise because a feature of these diseases, by and large, is the older you are, the more likely you're going to get it. We heard from Catherine that one in 500 people roughly have Parkinson's disease. If you look at this uh, cartoon, you can see that in the group of people who are over 65, one in 14 will have a dementia. And that group which are over 80, one in six. So the numbers are colossal. Right? So it's a big problem. So the next question that raises is if it's a big problem, and we've known that for a long time, and there's lots of terrific scientists, why do we have no treatments? The thing that unifies all of these diseases is that there's absolutely no treatment. And people with these diseases want treatments. They want treatments that will slow the disease. That would be terrific. Even better would be something that will stop the disease. And of course, the home run would be treatments that will restore function that is lost. And that's what's called regeneration or reparative medicine. One of the reasons we're so much further behind in brain diseases compared to other uh, um, organ systems like cancers or liver or heart is because of the complexity of how you discover medicines. What you can see on this slide is it takes 15 years to take a drug through the whole way through clinical trial to success. 
It's even more difficult for the brain because the brain, unlike every other organ, is inaccessible. If you've got liver disease or heart disease or skin disease or gut disease, you can take a biopsy and you can look at it in real time under the microscope. Now, you clearly can't do that for brain diseases. You know, I can't go and scoop out a piece of your brain or your spinal cord. So that's one of the challenges we have with brain diseases. Now, Sorrel, in a sense, has already given you the mini tutorial on how the brain works. But despite the complexity of the brain, the actual building blocks of the brain are very, are very simple. And I'm just going to summarize it here. The brain fundamentally is a, is a fantastic collection of electrical wires or nerves. And that's what's represented in this cartoon in blue. And those nerves are supported by other cell types. One of them is this red cell, which is, if you like, the insulation. So this insulation around the nerve or the wire results in control of electrical activity. So as I said, all our ability to move, to think, to feel, to remember, to emote reflects fantastically orchestrated electrical activity, which is what the brain is. And clearly, when one of those key cellular components of the brain goes wrong, you get disease. And that's represented here. So you can, if you can imagine damage of the nerve, you'll have a problem with the disease, damage of the insulation. Now that nerve cell, which is damaged, is in this part of the brain, in the midbrain, you might get Parkinson's disease. If it's called a motor nerve cell, you get motor neuron disease. If it's the insulating cell, as you've heard from Sorrel and you've heard more from Charles, you'll get MS. So imagine now, as you can see in this cartoon, that the nerve cell that's damaged in disease is the motor nerve cell. And the motor nerve cell connects to muscle. If you get damage there, you will get motor neuron disease. Of course, this is very much in, in the public's uh, focus because of Stephen Hawking, the um, ice bucket challenge, and more recently, the Oscar-winning film, The Theory of Everything. Is this going through? Yeah, there okay. is. So the point about motor neuron disease, in a sense, is at the extreme end of all those neurodegenerative diseases. It's a terrible disease. It's a disease characterized by paralysis. Paralysis of the muscles that control breathing, speaking, swallowing. Sadly, patients die because they effectively suffocate because they can't breathe. 50% of patients are dead within 24 to 36 months from diagnosis. That's a really shocking disease. So clearly the need to solve this disease is very high. And one of the great opportunities in the last 10 years or so is the opportunity that stem cells offer for medicine and particularly for regenerative neurology. So this is the idea of repairing the damaged brain. And stem cells are particularly powerful because they can do two things. And I'll show you on, on this slide. People often think about stem cells as using stem cells directly for treatment. If you, if you have a disease due to a loss of a cell, and you can make more of the cell in a dish, you can then replace the dying or dead cell. But because of the complexity of the brain, it's not quite as simple as that. Probably the major opportunity that stem cells offer for medicine and for the damaged brain, the degenerating brain, is it's a fantastic, if you like, 21st century tool for understanding more about the disease and using that knowledge to develop treatments that will be bespoke and personal to the patient. So that's what I call experimental opportunities of stem cells for medicine, particularly for brain diseases. And the thing that you can do with stem cells is twofold. By their very nature, they're scalable. So if you start with one cell, one cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and so on. So in a comparatively short time, you can generate unlimited numbers of these phenomenally powerful uh, cells, which we call pluripotent cells, because they can make any cell type in the body. So if you could, you've, got, you've now got a huge number of these cells. What we can now do is we can program them effectively or direct them using a form of, if you like, of scientific cookery to make those pluripotent cells all become, let's say, motor neuron cells or Parkinson cells or the insulating cells of MS. And by doing this, you now have this opportunity, which is extraordinary and would certainly never have occurred when I was at medical school a very long time ago. The idea that you can generate unlimited numbers of cells from an individual which are bespoke to them and are specific to their disease. So imagine that patient with motor neuron disease if you want to study that disease, you want to generate unlimited numbers of motor nerve cells from that patient. So if we could do that, that would be a terrific opportunity. And that's exactly what we can now do. And many of the projects in the BioRats portfolio exploit this opportunity that stem cells offer us 
to generate unlimited numbers of cells carrying disease to study. If you can study, you can learn more about it. So one of the big uh, steps forward in the last 10 years has come from these people on this cartoon. Now, most people don't know who the people are, but everybody knows who the animal is. The animal is Dolly the sheep. Dolly the sheep is very much an Edinburgh construct, and it's just it's about a mile from where we're speaking today. And Dolly the sheep, the, the sort of professional scientific father, at least of Dolly the sheep, is the chap with the beard, that's Ian Wilmot, or Sir Ian Wilmot, and the chap next to him, looks a bit like Michael Heseltine, is, <laughs> is Sir John Gurdon. So Sir John Gurdon and Ian Wilmot are pioneers in the field, and they basically uh, deconstructed how you can generate these master stem cells. And another colleague, a chap called Yamanaka, took this further. But the take home from all of these three people's brilliant research is today from anybody watching this broadcast, from anybody in this room, you can take a hair cell or a blood cell or a skin cell and using this form of scientific cookery, you can generate unlimited numbers of personalized your own stem cells. And from your own stem cells, we can make heart cells, liver cells, brain cells, nerve cells, motor nerve cells, Parkinson cells, the insulating cell you lose in MS. So that, if you just reflect on that, that's a very, very powerful tool. So now you can do a very simple experiment, and this is what we call model human disease in a dish. So imagine you've got a patient, here's the cartoon of the patient, imagine that patient's got motor neuron disease. You've taken from that patient a skin biopsy. From that skin biopsy, using these clever tools um, and approaches derived from those three researchers I've told you about, we can now generate personalized motor nerve cells. So we've now got motor nerve cells from the patient with the disease, and we can also compare those motor nerve cells to their unaffected relative or a sibling who doesn't have motor ne neuron disease. So you imagine that. So we've got motor nerve cells from the patient and motor nerve cells from an unaffected relative. So genetically, they're broadly the same. And what you can now do is a very simple experiment. You can just ask whether the motor nerve cells from the patient, do they die faster than the motor nerve cells from the unaffected relative? And that's represented on this graph. So the red line is the motor nerve cells from a patient with the disease. And the blue line is the motor nerve cells from an unaffected relative. And you can see there's a gap. And that gap represents the therapeutic gap. So the patient, motor nerves, are two and a half times more likely to die than their relative. So now there's a very simple experiment you can do. You can simply now go to the farmer, the big farmer, who've got hundreds of thousands of compounds on their shelves, and they don't know what to do with and they don't know whether they will work. And before, they used to test them in animal models. Now, animal models are clearly powerful, but if you can test them in humans, it will be that much closer. And this isn't humans, humans, but it's the next step. Because remember, these are human motor nerve cells in a dish which are functioning. So now what you can ask pharma to do is forget all the clever science. Just screen all your drugs onto these cells and find any drug that will make the red line get closer to the blue line. If you can get drugs that make the red line go close to the blue line, that's a high-value candidate which you can now take forward to trials. So now you can imagine, this is my last slide, so you can imagine now, if you go back to this cartoon, three to eight years is spent in pre-discovery work, trying to discover potential successful medicines, and you test them in animals. But what you can now do is you can short-circuit that by testing those potential compounds in human cells. So three to eight years could become one to five years or even less. But you've also increased your level of confidence of success because you've shown that not only do they have help in the animal model, but they make a difference to the human model in a dish. So you've got success in the animal, success in the human, which gives you greater confidence that will be more successful when you come to the patient trials. So that's the big idea of using stem cells as a therapeutic, opportunity to discover medicines for diseases that are presently untreatable. I don't know how much of that came through, but I hope that's helpful. <laughs> all, all, thank you very much. All of it, all, all, all of it came through uh, online, uh, um, and colleagues in the room missed the slides but can pick those up in the broadcast afterwards, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. And Our final speaker is Professor Charles French-Constant, 
who is the Professor of Medical Neurology at the University of Edinburgh. He's a former director of the uh, Centre for Regenerative Medicine there, a director of the University of Edinburgh's Multiple Sclerosis Research Centre and co-director of the Anne Rowling Regenerative Neurology Clinic. Uh, he was a professor of ne neurological genetics at Cambridge and a postdoctoral fellow at MIT in Boston. Charles is also a BIRAX recipient and with a lab at Hebrew University in Israel looking at the role of blood vessels in nerve cell regeneration. Charles, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, Siddharth has told you about how we can use stem cells to look at um, neurodegenerative diseases that are caused by intrinsic defects in the cell, the sorts of defects that cause motor neuron disease. What I want to do is, is show you another app of stem cell research, one that we're working on, as you've heard from Alan with colleagues at the Hebrew University, where we're focusing more on the role of stem cells for repair. Now, as you can see in this first slide, there are two major causes for neurodegenerative disease in the human brain. The first and the most common sort is where one has defects actually intrinsic to the neural cells themselves, but there are a group of diseases that are actually caused by a failure of repair in, of the brain. And, and MS is a nice example of this. As you've heard about MS um, already from Sorrel, which is just as well because it saves me a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of introduction. Now, MS, as you've heard, is a disease where the myelin is damaged, but what you may not know is that, like other tissues in the body, the brain has a limited capacity to repair itself. And in the case of myelin damage, it can actually do a reasonable job. So if you look at this slice here of a patient who died with MS, the area that's affected is the dark blue area in the middle where all the myelinated axons are. And you can see three areas that are completely white within that area, highlighted by a green arrow. And those are areas where the myelin's been completely destroyed and haven't come back. But if you look at the two smaller areas with the red arrows, you can see little circular areas where actually there's partial remyelination or repair as evidenced by that light blue staining, which is picking up the amount of myelin that's been reformed. And this repair is actually very important because it's the failure of the repair that causes the loss of the nerve fibers that leads to progressive MS. So as you can see in this slide, if you're unlucky enough to have an attack of MS and your myelin is damaged, there are two possible uh, courses that that area might take. The first, which is on your left, is that the air brain will repair the damage by remyelination, new myelin will be formed, and the axons will recover the nerve fibers will recover. On the right, however, you can see what happens if repair fails. The axons are then no longer protected, which as Sorrell's told you is a very important function of a myelin. They then degenerate, and as a result of that, you get progressive disability. And that's what causes progressive MS. It's a failure of repair. And just to give you an idea of how important these diseases that uh, result from repair failure might be, here I'm showing you the costs in millions of euros per year of some common neurological diseases. And you can see, for example, Parkinson's disease, which is the fifth down that we've heard about already, that costs the European Union about 13.9 billion euros every year. So we're talking huge numbers here. And when you compare that just as an aside with the amount of money that's spent on research, you can see just how um, woefully inadequate our efforts are. But the next one down is MS, that's 14 and a half billion. Then you have traumatic brain injury caused by knocks on the head, uh, 13 billion, 33 billion, sorry, and stroke at 64 billion. And in all of these diseases, it's the inability of the brain to repair itself that's responsible for the long-term problems. So this is a major problem for us. And it's for this reason that there's been an enormous amount of research into how we can actually promote repair. And the key discovery is that the substrate of repair in any tissue, be it liver, skin, brain, whatever, are stem cells. It's resident stem cells in our tissues that kicked back into life to generate new daughter cells that then promote repair. So this schematic simply shows you what happens in MS, 
stem cells surrounding the lesion, which I've represented with that dotted pink line, become activated. They migrate into the lesion where they generate new myelin forming cells, um, which generate the myelin sheaths that are lost in MS. And when this process of stem cell activation, migration and generation of new cells fails, that's when we see progressive disease. So what we need to do, if we're actually going to generate new regenerative therapies, is we have to better understand stem cells. We have to understand the signals that control them to develop medicines to actually react. And that's the purpose of our Virax project that I'm doing with Eni Keshet in Jerusalem. And the stem cells we're studying are a different sort of stem cell. These are the stem cells in the hippocampus, which is a region of your brain where new neurons are generated, new nerve cells are generated throughout life that are likely to be very important for our ability to learn and remember. But fascinating though that is, that's not what we're interested in the hippocampus for. We're interested in it because if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see that those stem cells that are normally quiet or quiescent become activated all the time and they generate new neurons. But they do this via the generation of an intermediate population of cells called amplifying progenitor cells that divide as well and increase the numbers of cells available for generating new neurons. And so what we have is a situation where the stem cells are effectively surrounded by the amplifying progenitor cells that they have generated. And the other cell type that we have to worry about when we're thinking about how stem cells are controlled are blood vessels. Stem cells live next to blood vessels. And you can see that very clearly in this slide here. On the right, you can see a section of brain which has been stained in blue for blood vessels and in red for stem cells and the divide and, and, and the progenitor cells that they form. And you can see that those stem and progenitor cells are in almost all cases closely aligned to a blood vessel. And if you're then not closely aligned to a blood vessel, that's probably because the blood vessel is just out of the plane of section in this view. Because if you do a three-dimensional reconstruction, you can see it very clearly, all of these cells are next to blood vessels. So we can simplify the environment of the stem cell, the questions that we need to study in very simple schematic here. We have a stem cell in green, and excuse my awful PowerPoint skills. We have a stem cell in green, a blood vessel underneath it in red, and we have the amplifying precursors in blue. And all of these cells form a little microenvironment, which is sometimes called a niche, the technical term for the stem cell microenvironment. And there are two signals that are important in this niche. The first is the signals from the blood vessels of the stem cell. And the second is the feedback signal from the amplifying precursors to the stem cells that tell the stem cells to be quiet. Because clearly, if you've got enough amplifying precursors, you don't need your stem cells. Now, when I went to Israel at the initial Barax meeting and talked about our work on stem cells, Eli Keshet came to see me at the coffee break and said quite rightly, look, Charles, you're interested in amplifying precursors. I'm interested in blood vessels. Together, we can work out how these stem cells are controlled. And that's how the Barax project was born. It was an, it was an obvious collaboration. We've got a few months to run. It's been great fun. We've got some very interesting results. And I'm just going to show you one set of them in my final two slides. So what we have to do if we're going to try and ask questions about the signals here is we have to basically change either the blood vessels or the amplifying precursors and ask what happens. And that's what we've done. So the experiments I'm going to show you where we've changed the amplifying precursors. And we do this by injecting the mouse, which you can see in the middle of this slide here, with a drug into the middle of the brain that's normally used for treating tumours. And the effect of this drug is to kill the dividing cells. And it kills all of the amplifying precursors. But then the stem cells get kicked into life. And remember, those are the cells that are normally being inhibited by that feedback loop, signal two. The stem cells are kicked back into life and the amplifying precursors come back.
back. And you can see that in the bottom of the graph on the bottom right, the control is the blue dots, and you can see that the number of amplifying precursors stays the same all the time. But in the experiment at day one, which is day one after you've finished administering the drug, you can see that there are no amplifying precursors, you've killed them all, then they start to come back as the stem cells activate. And you can see you get a classic rebound effect where at six days you have more than normal and then the whole system restores its equilibrium, comes back to day 10, comes back at day 10. So now what you can do is you can ask, well, what changes occur during that process? Because those changes will tell us the signals that we need to find to identify potential drug targets. So you can do that by cutting sections of the animal's brain at different times after the experiment and using a laser to cut out tiny little bits of tissue that correspond exactly to where the stem cells and the precursors are. And you can see how we've done that on the left. That's just one section where uh, Ali Rooney, who's doing this project, has cut out in five little bits of tissue that correspond to where the stem cells are. Then you analyze all of the genes that are expressed in those bits of tissue and you find out what's changed. And interestingly, we only found 131 genes that were changed. And so that within those 131 genes will be signal two. So the job now is to find out obviously what signal two is. And just to give you an, uh, an idea, I want you to focus on that funny looking thing on the right with all those red and blue squares in it. This is what's called a heat map, which is a way that we describe patterns of gene expression. And I want you to mentally divide that into four columns, four equal columns. The gene expression is shown in red, and when a gene is not expressed, it's in blue. If you look at the column on the left, you can see that there's a large set of genes in red. There are some 30 genes shown here. And those are the genes that are expressed in the normal hippocampus when it's just going about its normal business of generating neurons. Then we kill the amplifying precursors in the next column. You can see that all of those genes have gone. Now, the next two columns, the two on the right, you can see that they start, those two genes have, those genes have started to come back. But what we have got is a whole new set of genes on the bottom right of that heat map. And those are signal two. Those are the genes that are upregulated that effectively start to kick the stem cells back into life. And it's within that population that we've identified some very interesting targets that we're currently following up. So to summarize, I think that a very important facet of stem cell research is to try to understand tissue repair. And the idea is to find genuinely regenerative therapies that will complement the anti-damage therapies that you get if you go to your doctor at the moment. Thanks. Sure, thank you very much. A couple of minutes for, for some questions, and I draw I kick off, and then if anyone in the room has any questions, uh, let me let me know. So, Dalton, you said uh, there was some scientific cooking or cookery going on to create uh, stem cells, and I wondered if you could tell us a bit about how you how you regress cells or how you create these unlimited stem cells from a hair follicle. Yeah, it is, I mean it is scientific cookery. It's sort of upmarket cookery. It's, it's less devious than more sort of Gordon Ramsay's. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's essentially what those three different researchers uh, worked out is that four proteins or four ingredients when mixed in with the cells were sufficient to flip any cell into a master stem cell and then there is a separate um, set of ingredients to make the motor nerve to make the insulating cell to make the parkinson cell or indeed the liver cell and much of that knowledge is now understood so it can be readily exploited to take the patient who you've seen in the clinic, you've got a lot of information about their disease, their trajectory, take this blood sample, two months later, you can generate unlimited numbers of the cell that is relevant for their disease. And here we're talking about brain diseases. It's incredible. Um, Charles, I think on one of your pages, uh, web pages, it says 20 million people worldwide are diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease each year. And at present, they are all progressive and incurable. And you presented as some sobering statistics on, on cost. Um, I had two, two questions on, on that. One is, 
are all the numbers of diagnoses growing similarly in all parts of the world, thinking that we have a range of colleagues uh, on the call, and are there general preventative steps that we could take to reduce our risk of any of these diseases? Right, so I think Siddhartha will probably hopefully come in after me on this one as well. I make the observation that obviously as populations around the world are getting older, then obviously the incidence of neurodegenerative disease will inevitably rise and, and these associated societal costs. That said, there are some interesting changes in MS. That you, there, are, there are certainly reports of increasing frequencies of MS in countries close to the equator where normally the incidence of MS would be considered to be very low. And why that is, is actually an interesting and I think unresolved scientific question. Yeah, I mean, by and large, most of the major brain diseases roughly um, have similar levels in the older population. So where people are living above 75, you're going to see more of these diseases. But there are these um, unusual cases. So MS, just to remind people, is the exception to the rule in two ways. First of all, it affects younger people. So typically uh, women, three to one, male to three, female to male. Younger, typically 30s rather than 60s, 70s. The other curious thing about MS, and there's a big clue here, but nobody's worked it out. The further you are away from the equator as a rule of thumb, the more MS there is. So even within the UK, from London to Scott, from London to Aberdeen, the numbers per, per 100,000 are almost double. We don't know why that is. I mean, I mean, you don't have to go to medical school to deduce that might be something to do with sun or the lack of sun. I haven't been in Scotland. Like, <laughs> I can confirm that. Um, so, MS is a disease which does vary with geography, and the sun and vitamin D may or may not have something to do with it. Other reasons exist. But by and large, most of these diseases are roughly the same in most of your countries that you're in. Thank you. Um, and then two questions for the, for the whole panel. Something about, are there any general preventative steps that you talk to people about? And, and what sort of symptoms would there be in the early stages of Parkinson's, MS or MND? And, and when might they develop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, for Parkinson's, I think there really is no general preventative steps you can take. I think ironically, for people who can see me in the room as a slightly larger person, um, I would say like everything else, if you live a healthy lifestyle, eat well, um, don't drink too much, exercise, all those things, you probably, even if you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's, your disease progression will probably be slightly helped by that and you'll get more opportunities to take exercise. There's definitely slightly growing evidence that just keeping active physically does help you manage your Parkinson's symptoms better. Interestingly, you are slightly more likely, very slightly more likely to develop Parkinson's if you have ginger hair. If you're a man, you're slightly, tinily less likely to develop Parkinson's if you smoke. Oh. So it's like it's <laughs> minuscule, so it's minuscule. So it is not. Uh, other health risks are are uh, sponsored by Benson and Hedges. <laughs> absolutely not. Okay, absolutely that's the message not. So yeah, there's other health risks attached. So it's 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 so it's so general. Um, yeah, some similar messages actually. I think the cause of MS. We still have a huge amount to learn. Um, but we know that genetics and environmental factors both play a role. So in terms of prevention, I think there's a long way to go, but there's a, couple, a few things that we know to put about. So we, in the case of MS, smoking does seem to increase your risk of developing the condition with a small amount, and also obesity does seem to increase the risk of developing the condition as well. Um, but I think that's a, an area where we do need a huge amount more research for both conditions. Yeah. Actually. Um, I have a final question on innovations. Uh, and I wondered, for all of you, what you thought the main innovations that we've seen in the last 10 years have been, uh, those that will improve the lives of patients, either in research, in care and treatment, or in policy innovation. And we have a good story to tell in Scotland about a young man called Gordon Aikman, who's led a policy change. So maybe Sarah, you touch on that. So what innovations have you seen in the last 10 years, research, care and treatment, or policy? Do you want to go? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. Um, there's one major set of innovations around the biology. So the two revolutions, in medicine 
and which will have impact on brain disease are the genetic discoveries of the last decade. And, and that link to the power of stem cell that several people have told you about makes for a very powerful resource to learn more about the diseases, discover drugs faster. So that's one. The second is the understanding that um, no two people are the same. We need to evolve a much more precision or stratified approach to treatments. And so this is what in the states are called precision medicine in the UK, we call it stratified medicine. And that links to Gordon Aikman. What people like Gordon Aikman have been able to do is articulate very powerfully that you need to improve care clearly. But the day that you can integrate care, cutting edge care, with research, where every health opportunity becomes a research opportunity, you will then be able to do things much faster. So what we want to do is to turn every clinic where service and care is given to also a research opportunity. And when you start doing that, you can start to measure the trajectory of each individual person's disease. You can begin to stratify within the group of MS or Parkinson's patients or motor immune disease patients that there are different groups. And those different groups require different treatments. So that's what's called stratified medicine. So I think stratified medicine meets genetic discoveries with stem cells in between as a discovery tool. Makes for a positive, hopeful future. Thank you. John? So I think with, with a more basic research hat on, the, the key innovation for us has been the ability to analyze thousands and thousands of genes simultaneously, um, as I showed you in my presentation. You know, where I we analysed all of the genes expressed in the hippocampus and we identified 131. And if we had gone down the traditional one gene at a time candidate approach, it would have taken us decades to get that much information. And we probably have missed a lot of it because we wouldn't have thought of those genes in the first place. So this ability to generate from individual cells or from tiny bits of tissue all of the gene expression has completely transformed the way we do science. And I think I would definitely agree with what Charles is saying. And um, I think, in terms of something that has already and will even more so make a difference to the lives of people with MS, I think technology advancements is a big one. So now we have more and more people starting to use um, apps to track their symptoms over time so that when they have their appointment with their neurologist, they can take in this really detailed view of their, their symptoms and how they're changing over time, and that can be incredibly helpful. Um, we're seeing uh, big progress with things like um, FES, which is a system that um, uses electricity to stimulate muscles in the leg to help people with mobility problems. Um, there's just more and more technology innovations coming along. Um, another big one is that we've been funding some research, people using the Nintendo Wii as a kind of a practical exercise program for people. So if you're in a wheelchair, there's really practical advice um, for people that could use this Nintendo Wii in a creative way to still get exercise and it's useful advice for people with MS based on their certain situations. We know exercise can be quite beneficial in MS. So it's kind of using technology in creative ways to make a real practical difference to people's lives. Um, and another, another really good example of that is the MS Register, which is this huge database of people's symptoms, people's experiences with MS, where people with MS go and fill in this on, online themselves. That data is linked up with their clinical data, um, so their uh, scans, their things from the NHS. So this is hugely useful for researchers, and that enormous rich database of information about people with MS is, is going to be hugely useful and becoming more so in the years to come. So for me, I think technology is the one that's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, if I was a person with Parkinson's sitting here, what would be the thing I would say is really mm, the thing that has sustained me and given me the most hope in the last five to ten years. I think now the future of research that uh, Charles and Siddhartha and Sorrell have talked to, I think really does excite people with Parkinson's to that intermeshing of the different fields of, of research and watching as a society, scientific community really starts to collaborate. It really, really gives good real hope. Um, but for somebody with Parkinson's living here and now, perhaps in the UK, I think they would say the thing that's really improved their lives in the past 10 years is having sustained contact with health and social care professionals that understand and know about concerns and that can really hook them into appropriate treatments, recommend advice about exercise, recommend perhaps when somebody needs some psychological counselling or perhaps goes on to have a deep brain stimulation operation. That 
constant interaction with health and social care professionals that understand the disease is actually what people with Parkinson's tell us time and time again is the number one thing that makes the biggest difference in their lives day to day. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time today. We're going to finish just with a bit of a plug from Alex about our work, which we're shameless about. Thank and why you. we've set up this fund. Exactly. Thank you. And thanks to everyone. It was really, really interesting. Um, we've heard this afternoon about some of the projects that Barrex is supporting. And we're, we're supporting 15 in total that deal with a range of conditions, diabetes, heart disease, and of course, the neurodegenerative conditions we heard about today, as well as some general stem cell and regenerative medicine therapies. Um, what the Barrex programme is trying to do is bring scientific excellence from both countries that the UK and Israel are seen as leaders in the field with the gentle medicine. Um, and as Charles says about his project, it's genuine collaborations. Um, so we're working to, to, get more, to get more partners and more projects supported um, in partnership with organisations like the MS Society and Parkinson's UK. So we're working now on the, what will be the third round where we hope to support another seven to eight projects um, and maybe bringing in some additional fields, so arthritis or motor neuron disease and others. Um, in two weeks time, we're bringing 350 researchers together at the University of Oxford from the UK and from Israel. And we hope to have more stories um, to be able to support more projects and to see more developments that have the potential to impact globally, because these conditions aren't restricted to the countries in which we're working in, but, but across the globe. And the other thing that we've, we've been able to do um, as a result of the first webcast on diabetes is we've started a staff support forum for British Council staff who are affected or impacted by diabetes. And if anyone wants to know more about that, then please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Alex. So find out more about the Biorax programme at the British Council Israel site. Parkinson's Awareness Week is the 18th to the 24th of April. You can find out more at parkinsons.org.uk. The MS Society is at mssociety.org.uk and Michelle Mitchell, their CEO, and you are running the London Marathon. You can donate on Michelle's Just Giving page. She's already uh, raised £2,000 more than her target. And we talked a bit about Gordon Aitman and you can find his site, gordonsfightback.com, where he's raised almost £470,000 for MND research. Thanks very much for joining us.